All right, uh, welcome all to uh, the June installment of Passive Health Alberta's Coffee Talk. Uh, my name is Frank Crawford. I am the Education Committee Lead with Passive Health Alberta. And today we are having uh, Kevin Brown, who is a certified Passive House consultant, or certified Passive House designer, and one of the premier ones in uh, Calgary and Alberta, as well as Axel Sorensen from Sorensen's Homes, who's one of the premier uh, net zero builders and uh, is starting to dabble in the Passive House uh, in Calgary. And they are going to be talking to us about uh, Project Leo, which is a new house uh, nearing, nearing the end of construction in uh, Calgary. So I will turn it over to them to uh, do a better, like a longer introduction and uh, to tell us all about their lovely house. Again, if you have any questions, type them into the uh, chat box and uh, we will have a question and answer period at the end. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Axel Sorensen, uh, uh, the builder owner operator of uh, Homes by Sorensen. Um, and, uh, we um, got approached by our clients here for, where, for this uh, Passive House Leo project that we took on here in the inner city of Calgary. Uh, we got approached by them uh, a year and a half ago. Um, uh, uh, Frank Crawford had done uh, an analysis on a lot that they had uh, chosen um, and they were uh, looking to do a Passive House project on this. Um, and they had uh, a couple of interesting requirements for their passive house that I'll get into in just a bit here. Um, uh, so once we got on board with them, uh, we ended up uh, going back and forth with Frank a little bit, but we ended up on uh, bringing Kevin Brown on to do the uh, uh, passive house uh, model here. Um, and uh, so that's kind of how our team consists of. And, um, and yeah, so anyways, uh, um, the Leo Passive House is uh, uh, one of our goals with it was having a low embodied carbon. Uh, that was one of the things that the customers were very interested in doing and hitting the uh, um, Passive House uh, um, uh, low energy. This one hits the Passive House uh, low energy uh, target and it also is uh, we'll be hitting the um, passive house plus as well we'll, we'll have enough uh, solar on there to be net zero um, Kevin do you want to chat a little bit more about the the overall model here as well before we get into the building of it um, yeah well the it was the interest on the part of the clients for low embodied energy as well as uh, seeing about the passive house standard was interesting and axel being a, a net zero builder uh, uh, was interesting too um, i'll rattle on a little bit about the location which made it personally a really fun project for me uh, once i show some of the shading details but uh yeah so it was a good project to get in on i was very happy to have the opportunity so I'm going to go ahead and share screen and, and uh, Axel can talk a little bit about some of the construction details and, uh, and uh, some of the choices that were made in the way through. And then I'll talk a little bit about the uh, passive house modeling and the passive house component. Now, one thing that was really great is that because Axel had net zero experience, we had some really good discussions on the way through um, uh, concerning uh, you know, uh, different uh, techniques and possibilities. Um, and uh, so that was that was always uh, a, a great deal of pleasure to engage in with Axel. So I'll go ahead and share the screen and we can have a look at some photos while Axel continues. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so um, the uh, um, definitely chatting with uh, Frank and, and Kevin, we had lots of different ideas on what to do with this house here. Um, like we said, the low embodied carbon was a a large uh, um, goal of this project. So um, not pouring concrete foundation walls definitely added to that. Uh, so the foundation that you see here, this is uh, SI construction uh, foundation system out of Edmonton. <clears throat> and uh, uh, it was our first time working with it and it, it did go quite well. Um, uh, that wall that you see there is uh, 11 and a quarter inches thick. 
with a six inch uh, uh, structural steel stud to the inside. So you still have five and a quarter inches of continuous foam all the way around for a complete uh, thermal break there. Um, uh, so that was our foundation system there. Uh, I can, I, I'll definitely get into the um, pros and cons with this thing. Overall, it was a good experience, I would say. Um, uh, but I'll definitely get into a little bit more of the pros and cons. Unless you think I should get into that now here, Kev. Do you or maybe we'll meet, should we now? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the great thing about this foundation uh, here is that the, um, uh, um, is that it, it, it kind of just goes together like the Lego. So it's quite easy and, and right from the moment you're done excavating, you know, a framer can come in, they can form up the footings and, and move right onto the walls and, and keep going. Uh, so in terms of timing, it, it does move things along quite nicely. Uh, one of the things that you have to be extremely careful with this system is that that footing gets poured uh, extremely level. Uh, it's not like a typical footing where you're going to be putting a, a sight cast uh, a concrete wall on top and then using a ladder to level your wall off. Your, your wall is as level as that footing, so you need to be extremely careful with that. Um, uh, and then the other part as well is you have to have this foundation completely capped uh, before you can backfill as well. So one thing with a, a normal uh, foundation there, uh, we would probably backfill a little earlier, but um, overall, uh, it, it, it didn't go, it went, it went quite well and the framers were able to figure it out. So the construction ability of the wall or doing the, the SI foundation, I thought was not, was not, uh, was easily achievable for any framer to show up and, and fasten that stuff together there. Um, so, uh, and here you can see our uh, floor system uh, going back on. You do want to just go back one there, Kev? Um, basically, that uh, the top of the wall gets fastened in with this uh, metal Z track. Uh, so that kind of locks all the wall in together. And then the, um, and then there's a, uh, a two by six that goes on top of that and, and gets screwed in. And then all the lumber gets nailed in from there. So the subfloor on, you know, you're back to a process that is very familiar to these guys. Uh, just like doing any uh, um, subfloor. Um, but at the subfloor level here, uh, um, we start to uh, um, do some things that are slightly different here. So all that, that subfloor is, uh, is in, uh, I believe, uh, um, the five inches. Um, not all the way to the outside so that we and we have a piece of foam block that got custom made to sit on top of the foundation wall or sit yeah sit on top of the foundation wall so that this the subfloor is inbound to that and we had a complete thermal break uh there as well you can kind of see uh there's a on the very bottom of that picture there uh there's um uh the Z track or the two by six and then the subfloor that goes on top of that we had a custom piece of foam that would go into that hole there, um, as well as what you're seeing there uh, is all the, the rim board and the subfloor there. Um, and you can see some caulking there. Uh, we also went uh, back through that whole thing and used SIGA tape to tape all the, uh, the seams there as well. So that our rim board ended up being our vapor barrier on our subfloor. Yeah, there's a, a decent one there. Um, the rim board ended up being our subfloor, uh, and, uh, or sorry, our rim board ended up being our vapor barrier and air barrier. And then we had, uh, a foam block that was outbound of that. Um, this was important to do not only from a thermal bridging perspective, but also it got us away from using any spray foam on the joist ends on this project. Um, so uh at the very bottom of that z track there's i believe that six inches of foam and then once we're past the z track there the majority of that uh rim board got a, a complete eight inch thick block of foam there um 
so uh our at our rim joist area there there's there's very little thermal bridging throughout that um yeah okay so then past that uh our basement um kevin and i did this together here you can see him on the right side of that photo there we used the uh the stego wrap uh it's a 15 mil product so extremely durable you can walk on gravel with it and it doesn't puncture it it's uh um a great product to use there and then we we're using the green siga tape there to to tape all our uh penetrations um and uh so that went uh, quite well so we had um uh our six or eight inches of gravel um below that uh that stega uh wrap there um and then on top of that we have uh eight inches of, of foam uh, that insulates our basement slab there. And that was uh, continuous. And I actually um, ended up using um, four foot by eight foot sheets of the foam. Um, and uh, it actually went, uh, I thought pretty good. I got the seams extremely tight. Um, anywhere where maybe I had maybe a small break in the seam, I. Uh, Put a little spray foam in there, but I thought the basement went really well with the eight inch block. I know some guys have done it with two layers of four inch, but the eight inch really wasn't that bad. And once you kind of figure out how to cut those holes through an eight inch block of foam, uh, it went um, it went really well there. So uh, yeah, I thought that went really good. And the other um, and the other the other thing is for putting the stego wrap at the very bottom. Instead of at the top, when the, when I had my flat workers come out to do the rebar, there was no real membrane for him for them to puncture. You know, it it um, kind of was foolproof for them not to ruin my uh, vapor and air barrier there. Uh, so um, that was one of our reasons for putting a vapor barrier and air barrier below the insulation there. Uh, Kev, I don't know if we got a photo of the basement with the two inch um uh the two inch eps to to stop the concrete slab from touching the steel studs but you've got you've got the one uh detail there well anyways we i'm not sure if i have a photo here but we put a we used a um two inch piece of eps around the entire perimeter there as well so when that concrete slab got poured it never touched the steel studs just to help minimize our thermal bridging because those steel studs touch a steel track that got bolted into the uh, footing um so we just didn't want it uh, we just wanted to minimize that thermal bridging there um that was one other detail we did in there so um yeah so this is below on that photo there you can see that's the si foundation uh, below there with a little PVC strip that you could use for uh, nailing on siding if you wanted. Um, and, uh, and then we had that custom piece of foam put on top of that. Uh, and, um, uh, and then we, we spray foamed all the little seams there as well. And then the framer brought his, uh, yeah, go back there. The framer put his, his last two feet of sheathing on his wall. Um, and that was that sheet was continuous all the way down to the um, uh, to the PVC strips. So the framer sheathing uh, also doesn't have any fasteners that go through that foam into the rim board, further eliminating any uh, um, uh, thermal bridging there through the the rim board area there. Um, okay. Uh, um, now this, so the, the wall system that you're seeing here above grade is a double studded wall system, 19.2 uh, on center studs. Um, and uh, uh, we, we had a five inch void between the stud, uh, the, the studs there. So for a combined uh, 12 inch um, uh, cavity to fill with dense back cellulose. Um, and then we use the certainty membrane on top of that. And I think, um, not like obviously the double-sided wall system isn't uh, innovative 
at this point in the high performance industry. But I think the, the, the part that I found innovative for this whole project was just how using this basement system with the double studded wall system and having the load bearing to the inside. And basically you just had the outer uh, double studded wall was just there to hold insulation in. Um, it allowed us to have this continuous foam right from the top of the footing all the way to the other side of the roof deck. And the only things that really extend out are the three quarter inch OSB uh, sheathing just to uh, hold the walls together. Um, there was some, uh, some framing members uh, as well that got um, gusseted, uh, uh, some gusset plates um, to help hold up the exterior wall because technically there it's only sitting on foam the whole way down. Uh, that was an engineer's detail, but for the most part, this wall is extremely well thermally broken. Uh, um, and the other part that I really liked was that it ended me off with uh, just regular 3 8 uh, OSB or plywood on the outside uh, so that the siders, uh, the construction ability for them was was high. It's, it's a job that was pretty much just as normal, other than the fact that we set our windows into the middle of the, the wall system. Uh, I guess things like that are, are important to me to make sure that we're um, uh, building these houses in a way that kind of makes it a, as achievable as possible because I find that's usually how you're going to get your best results here. Um, but yeah, uh, and then just a little bit on the membranes here that you're seeing here. So obviously I said that we use the certainty membrane on the exterior wall uh, above grade just to make sure that we could breathe inwards. Uh, basically once that wall cavity, if the hum relative humidity was ever to get up above 60%, the pores of that vapor barrier would open up and it would breathe inwards. Um, so just to help the dryability of the wall, the wall out. Um, the certainty membrane is one that I would not do again, just because it, it actually is quite brittle. And by the time we were done with the wall, it, um, we had a lot of patchwork done on it. And uh, I probably wouldn't do that again. Um, I would either be looking at uh, just using regular 10 mil um, uh, poly or using a, a more high performance um, smart membrane from uh, Europe or something that would be a little more, would, have a, a, a little more durability than this one here. Um, but that's just the stuff we learn as we go here. So, um, so here's our uh, windows here. Um, we used uh, windows from Intertech. Uh, they've got a, uh, a cool temperate climate passive house certified window. Um, that we actually saw worked uh, extremely well here. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, here you'll, you see the, uh, the cladding. We basically over insulated the outside of all the windows with two inches of uh, rigid foam. And uh, um, we used uh, uh, vapor open SIGA tape to tape around the windows. And then we finished it off with a metal clad uh, on top of all that. So I don't know if I've got the photo in here of the former going around the windows, but, um, so yeah, those are our windows, but th this window package here, uh, in a tech from what I saw, uh, for the price point and for the quality, they were the best bang for the buck. Um, one of the, and it's also one of the reasons why we could only hit our low energy, uh, standard here instead of hitting uh, um, Passive House Classic standard. Um, these were only cool tempered climate windows and probably we needed cold tempered climate uh, certified windows to, to have a chance of hitting that. Um, probably Kevin knows a little bit more of how close we would have been if we had gone that direction, but the cost difference was about 40 or $50,000. Uh, these windows versus uh, a cold temper climate passive house certified window. So um, cost definitely comes into these things and, and, and 
you, you have to follow a bit of a budget sometimes, especially with the clients we had, like they, they definitely spent most of their budget on their building envelope, uh, but they weren't willing to um, go crazy to just to try and hit classic here. So um, yeah, and, uh, and we finished off to help the drivability of this wall system with a three quarter inch rain screen and clouded it with, uh, with hardy board siding here. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's basically our, uh, wall system there. We did, um, I don't think I had a photo there. Sorry, I probably could have added maybe a few more photos here, but the, um, we did have a mechanical wall inside of the, uh, um, the double studded wall. So that, uh, certain deep membrane, uh, um, was, uh, hidden behind the wall there so that all the mechanicals were inside of that. And, um, uh, and then we also batted that uh, stud bay with just a regular uh, R12 fiberglass bat. Um, uh, anyways, um, yeah, so I think that's a little bit about our system there. Um, oh, maybe the roof, I haven't touched on the roof here yet, but our, uh, our roof, we just had uh, an R80, uh, um, cellulose loose fill in there. Um, Kev, I think I'll turn it over to you here and uh, you can maybe go over the model here a little bit. Yeah, sure, sounds good. I'm gonna sh share uh, um, a few things about the, uh, the process going forward. So yeah, um, with the, when I started in the project, I usually have a look at the site first um, and uh, we were, we were looking at uh, the site, we didn't have, uh, we had a rough idea of what we wanted in terms of the, of the building. So we knew roughly what size it was going to be. And I went ahead and, and modeled the shading as soon as I could. And what I did is I, I actually went through before I had plans, I went through and did the calculation on the lot coverage and what was available to us which ended up being a, a nice way to get a take on what was going on with the shading in the house um, to allow me to start building a passive house planning program model off of it. So uh, originally there was a huge number of trees in the background. This was actually quite a big garage, but that was all the north side. So it didn't impact on it um, a lot. Uh, most of the trees in the backyard ended up getting taken down just because they were encroaching on the build site and being a problem. Um, and the trees in the front yard stay. I went on a little bit during the introduction about why it was personally interesting to me. And one of the reasons why is that this is the school I went to from, well, from grade one to grade three in that little building and then up to the end of grade eight in this building. So that's uh, uh, Balmoral Junior High and Elementary back at the time. And I'm pretty certain that this house right here, the next door neighbor was where one of my playground nemesis lived. So I was uh, quite happy to um, work in the neighborhood and be able to work on a passive house across the street from my old school. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So it allowed me to get going on a model fairly quickly and, and allowed us to have conversations back and forth about the possibility. Um, these are mostly, you know, green ash green ash trees up the front. So really beautiful shading, particularly from this tree um, during the summer season. And of course they drop their leaves mostly. This is an Engelmann spruce tree right here with a green ash planted right beside it. But this spruce tree does present some shading in the winter time, which is unfortunate from the point of view of the front facade, but uh, you know, whatever, it's an urban site, that's the way it goes. And then as soon as, uh, as soon as I was able to um, get some plans, we had concept plans of elevations, and then I was able to uh, change things up as we went along. So one of the things about uh, doing that, and this is the most recent set of plans, but in the end, we did have some, the blue outlines there, are the actual installed windows. There were some changes as we went through and uh, things bounced around a bit. So to verify the Passivos model, this requires a little bit more refinement, but because of the build process, um, we're not going to, you know, with, with a single family home, you very rarely um, create 
um, as built drawings, you go with the best that you had before you made a few changes and uh, then you, you take it from there. So this allowed me to do that. Um, then we had a look at the, I had a look at the treated floor area and uh, that changed back and forth. Um, this is the, the main floor. And this talks to one of the reasons why this would have been a difficult project to get to Passive House Classic, um, particularly when you look at the upper floor. So it's a front to back duplex, um, all one family, age in place ideals for the, for the, uh, uh, the one um, unit at the front two story, and this is a three story. And this is the main solar gain for the second story. So it presents some difficulty in making sure that the main and lower floors are, are heated. So we provided, in the end, we provided a little bit more backup heat for the main and lower floors that would be fully automatic when the, uh, when the clients uh, are away from home. So we're just working on the details of making sure that we control that properly for them. On the main floor, there's bedroom space um, and bedroom washroom space, walk-in closet for the back unit and uh, the main living area um, for the upper, the, the front unit. And then when you have a look at the lower unit, we've got an unfinished basement, which I've modeled at 60% utilization for the purposes of ventilation system, but that can, you know, we made sure that we, we have enough ventilation in terms of a heat recovery ventilator to be able to fully, um, uh, provide uh, uh, a ventilation for that space. But this does give uh, room for the introduction of, a, of a, uh, another bedroom there. So it can be a two bedroom space in the back and within the front unit, the, the bedroom quarters with fairly generous uh, windows out front for a decent amount of solar gain, but still allowing some, you know, it's not quite as warm as the main floor. And so that allows for cool sleeping and uh, the good thing about the residents in the back is that they said, oh, we sleep cool anyway, so don't worry about it too, too much. And so, uh, yeah. And then going through again, uh, one of the things about the, uh, this uh, uh, unit is that it's a separate, uh, there's some shading details entered. And this, uh, what do I got that yellow? Well, that's for some site verification after the fact. Yes, just to make sure that my, my height of the shaded object is actually accurate and we, uh, we continue. So I, I quite often will color stuff in PHPP just to make sure that I've got, uh, you know, I do a site check. So we have, for certification purposes, we have the as built. Um, so yeah, and then with the ventilation, it's two units. And so you have your basics entries here, but after a while it, you, you kind of go, what? And that's because it is a, 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 a two unit place. So we've entered into additional ventilation. And uh, one, one uh, issue that we had to do with PASFO certification is that we decided to go with a, 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 uh, uh, the approach, pardon me, at the beginning of the of the uh, project was to uh, uh, make sure that it, it followed the the intent, if not the rule, of passive household energy home, and uh, we did end up getting some funding from SSRAA, which was we're very grateful for, and because uh, it did allow us to go ahead and purchase a sand and hot water um, heat pump system that allows us to get domestic hot water extremely efficiently and provide also calve some of that hot water off and uh, use it to supply um, some heating energy for with a post heater for the uh, back um, the back unit which is uh, the the that's the source of the uh, extra makeup heat that we're providing for for that unit uh, given the challenges of getting enough solar gain in the unit to fully cover the uh, heat load with the sun so yeah, that's a, that's a very quick run through. Um, I don't know, um, you know, use it will if you like some of my, the ideas of how I approach that. But uh, it's been a, a great deal of pleasure again, uh, going through to uh, um, 
work with Axel and the crew and uh, work with Frank back and forth. Um, yeah, um, I'm gonna uh, uh, quit jabbering on at that point because I'm looking at the time um, and hopefully what we've managed to say so far uh, 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 twigs some questions on the part of the audience. Um, and Axel, I'm curious, uh, like you and I have had really good discussions on the way through. Frank's been giving you input as well. You mentioned that, but, uh, and you mentioned the vapor barrier, but uh, we had a discussion ourselves about uh, the utility of putting the two by four mechanical wall in front of that vapor barrier. And you had some comments. Why don't you open up uh, back and forth between you and I with, with some comments on that? Because that's, that's an ongoing discussion and one that's really interesting. Yeah, okay, <laughs> no, um, for sure. So uh, I guess just a little bit of background behind the, where this comment's coming from. My, um, one of my goals is to bring net zero housing kind of uh, to the masses and to be only doing net zero housing. And, um, and definitely we have uh, looked into um, the marketplace, I'd say quite a bit and, and talked to lots of people and, and, and I'm sure most of you guys have all known this as well, but when it comes to high performance homes, bringing it to the masses, the only thing that's gonna do that is making it economically viable and making it as easy as possible to bring it to them. Uh, obviously, when it comes to custom homes, you know, people maybe want to hit a bit of a higher standard. Um, passive homes is is one of those standards. Um, anyways, uh, uh, so uh, basically, uh, we Fra uh, Frank and I have, or uh, Kevin and I had a bit of a difference of opinion, and my opinion was is more of just a question, really. Um, the double studded wall system, I, I really do like building it. And I think the construction ability of a double studded wall system is, is very high. Um, on this site here, we wanted to try and keep our vapor barrier as unscathed and unharmed as possible. And so we hit it in the wall with a mechanical chase. By doing that, um, the construction ability does uh, fall a little bit, just in the sense that um, you have to insulate your house first. There's there's a few different return trips for trades just to get things roughed in. You have to have the framers come back and forth. Uh, there's so there's definitely some added things there. Um, my experience with net zero homes is is not hiding the vapor barrier in the wall. It is uh, using the double studded wall system and having all the mechanicals within that double studded wall system and the vapor barrier on top of that with the drywall sandwiching in it right afterwards. Um, it's, it, it makes the construction process very similar to just a regular old spec build house and it, it makes things easy that way. Now, uh, with my net zero homes, I've, I've, I've uh, had a decent track record of getting down to 0.4s and 0.5s with them. Um, and uh, so I guess my thought was, you know, why would you use a, the mechanical wall uh, you know, if I can get you down to that, that number, obviously the first comment back will be that, well, maybe it's, it's going to degrade faster over time. Um, but to what extent, I guess, is, is the part that most people probably don't know, you know, if, if you're going to go hang up some pictures and maybe in 20 years time, what would you be at a 0.7? That would be the question that I don't know of, but that I would be, you know, just in terms of doing this for people a little bit more in the masses, that's the process that I would be looking at mo moving towards instead of doing a mechanical chase, which just makes your building a little bit more tougher to do. Yeah, and so that was that was interesting feedback, right, from from the contractor's point of view, and uh, certainly there's a there's an issue there. Um, my experience uh, in passive houses, I, I worked for eight years with uh, One House Green and Alan Nixon, who ran that firm, and myself were, you know, we're two guys and, and a bunch of sub trades. And uh, one thing when we started looking at the building science of a thick wall system, we wanted to make good and darn sure that our buildings were durable, that they were extremely long lasting. And so we went uh, the other direction completely. We decided that. Um, uh, three quarter inch OSB was going to be our vapor barrier of course, of choice, pardon me, um, thoroughly taped. 
I've heard comments from people trying to use 5.8 uh, OSB, which does meet the code for a vapor barrier, but uh, um, it also has some air exfiltration problems. It's not quite as vapor sealed as a lot of people would like. So a lot of people go to 5.8 plywood for that. Um, we decided to use three quarter inch OSB because it would uh, slow down vapor transfer enough to get rid of some of the wintertime frost, potential wintertime frost issues within the wall. We wanted a highly breathable vapor open yet highly airtight and highly breathable system. So that's why we went there. When I was, uh, when Axel and I first started looking at it, I did a, a, a little spreadsheet that showed the per square foot cost of just the materials alone. And then with some consideration for installation and three quarter inch OSB was just so expensive. It came into multi dollars per square foot. Um, unfortunately, I did that spreadsheet and then promptly um, did not save it in time, had a computer crash and lost it. But by that time I got the data and Axel and I had had a discussion. I have to rebuild that. But uh, yeah, it was, it, and plus the, the installability, the constructability of that was uh, relatively low in comparison to a membrane. So my vapor barrier of choice now is a, is a European membrane. Um, cert, uh, um, I was very interested in seeing about the certainty membrane because it promised the same kind of performance. In other words, it's vapor closed at uh, certain times and when the humidity gradient is appropriate, it's vapor open, it helps to dry out the wall. So it has the same kind of um, work, uh, the same operation claims that the European membranes do have, such as uh, Intello Plus, but uh, without some of the uh, other issues. Um, now, having gone through that, um, Axel, you're actually making it, you were finding it easier and getting better blower door tests out of uh, just straight six mil poly, as far as I recall, in our conversations. So, and now the, the, the ability of the vapor barrier membrane, Axel and I had a conversation about that um, earlier in regards to the, the uh, mechanical wall. The nice thing about a more uh, rigid, such as an OSB vapor barrier or a European membrane, is that you're very strictly controlling your, your exterior penetrations. So if you build a mechanical chase inside, then you're only worrying about the vapor seal of what, three or four electrical wires going outside for exterior lights, for garage lights if you have an attached garage, and uh, a couple of hose bibs and then the penetration through your, your floor, which you see is relatively easy to seal up so long as you install that correctly. Um, so you, you don't have a penetration of your vapor barrier for plumbing pipes um, with the exception of a stack and uh, what goes through the basement and your hose bibs. You don't have every single exterior wall um, electrical box to worry about. And as Axel alluded to, over time, you don't have a problem with penetration of your vapor barrier. Now, one, one thing I brought up and Axel and I were going bah, 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 back and forth, it was a fun discussion. But uh, if you go to alter something, if a client goes to alter drywall, when you have a, a broken um, a mechanical chase wall, you can go ahead, saw apart the drywall. Like don't take a sawzall with a 12 inch blade and hack apart your drywall that way, but you can cut it out with a knife or with a sawzall with a short blade on it. And you can make changes to your interior walls in your drywall without having to worry about your vapor barrier at all. Grandma can hang up as many pictures of her children and grandchildren as she wants, and you don't have to worry about that. So it's a trade-off and it's a long-term um, long benefit um, trade off and it's an ongoing discussions. It's it's quite fascinating. Yeah, still still not quite uh, perfect answers yet. Everything kind of depends on what uh, local conditions and what you can uh, what you can uh, build best yourself. That's right. Um, so not, there's nothing from the chat, but I guess anyone that's uh, watching, if you want to turn on your uh, your videos and and ask a question, then yeah, thank you, Axel, and thank you, uh, Kevin, for chatting about this uh, this excellent. Uh, project. So yeah, is there any, any questions that we have out there? Any discussions that uh, people saw that wanted to bring up again? Um, if not, and uh, you want to learn some more about this and uh, some other excellent uh, uh, high performance net zero houses, uh, the reason we actually moved it to this date, or 
Coffee Talk this month is because this weekend is the Calgary version uh, of the Eco Solar Home Tours uh, and Axel's house, the Project Leo is on it, as well as my house, as well as I think there's probably about 15 or 20 uh, uh, high performance homes uh, this weekend. If you search this uh, Eco Solar Home Tours, uh, you'll find the Calgary one this weekend. And then next weekend is uh, one day of tours in uh, Lethbridge and this year, because, because of COVID, they are all uh, online. So uh, it's much easier to see everyone's houses and uh, get the conversations uh, without driving around everywhere. So uh, any questions from the audience? I see Dave Vanesh is on the call. Um, the, um, he's of course with Skyfire Energy. And uh, yeah, I wonder if you have any comments, Dave, about the, uh, the um, yeah, the, because the solar system is going to be supplied by Skyfire and and get on the roof, and it's an interesting uh, application. Well, that's that's good to hear. I wasn't I wasn't sure if it was the case when I was uh, I, I joined for for personal reasons, you know, looking to eventually build a, a home of my own and, and learning more and more about passive houses. So uh, so appreciate the presentation. I can't really add much from the solar side, not not knowing the specifics of the project, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess I, I was curious. Um, uh, around the, you know, maybe you touched on it, but how you managed, you know, with the split front back, like that would just seem like a massive challenge to, to manage that from a, uh, from a heating perspective. Um, is there a fairly significant, like, are they independently, uh, metered for electricity? And then are you, um, is it pretty significant different differences between them as far as the heating load requirements, I suppose. And I'm curious if you could just uh, dig in on that a little more. I'll let uh, Kevin answer the heating load question, but they're, uh, they're not independently metered. So they're on the, the same uh, um, meter there. We did that for cost effective reasons. Uh, having two, two panels, two meters, that would be um, more. And I am, um, yeah, anyway, so they're on, they're on the same. Uh, the the heating part definitely one of the biggest challenges of this house was that uh, it's such a long skinny house so for a passive home to only have you know uh, 25 feet of southern exposure um, so we did the the bungalow and then the two story that way both homes had a, a full wall of southern exposure there um, that was the best that we could uh, we could do in terms of getting up that. Uh, um, the original design was these people came with a bungalow. So it's two floors with a slab on grade and uh, they were gonna just do one, one up and one down unit here. And uh, that, they, want, they were gonna go fairly simple like that originally. So they, again, they would have both still had the same amount of Southern exposure. Um, they got talked out of that just because of uh, some soundproofing issues with with that once we kind of got into it so then we decided to go to this front back system so then we got to the bungalow and the two-story home with uh and still had them getting both uh, a southern exposure like the side walls here are 58 feet long here so the side of the house is 58 feet so there's a ton of east west and and a little bit of north there uh um um, so yeah, anyways, uh, and, and they're both independently heated as well. They both have their own HRV with, uh, preheaters on there. And, and I believe now with, uh, sand in addition with our funding, we're now doing a post heater for the back HRV. Um, so yeah, and Kev, you can answer the, the heating load for both of them there. Yeah, the PHPP was run as the whole building. The only reason the separation was for the ventilation load. And uh, so the whole building, the, the uh, heating loads riding right around 31 right, right at the moment. So we're just a little above the meeting the passive house low energy standard, which is at 30. I should say that now I always, I always get my nomenclature mixed up there. Pardon me, that's the heat demand. The heating load um, is, is sitting around 15, 17 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. But in, in a cold climate, we're usually not able to meet that standard. It, it, the passive house system wants to be 10, but it's an either or situation. So you can uh, meet your heat demand or your heating load. Um, in the cold climate, your heat demand is more important anyway. 
um, as long as you, you, you know, you want to, you always have to satisfy your heating load. So even if you can't meet the standard width, even if it's 17 kilowatt hours per square meter per year rather than 10, you still have to make sure that that, that uh, load is satisfied. But the heat demand is a is a far easier number to uh, to meet. Um, so yeah, so the front back situation, I mean, there was a great deal of thought put into where the warm areas of the house were going to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the sleeping, um, the cool um, temperatures, sleeping, um, uh, uh, sleepability, you want to say, of the house is planned that way. So that the bedrooms in the, uh, in the rear unit are on the main floor. So they are shaded completely by the uh, for the south, in the south by the front unit. But the area where they want to have warmth and they want to be comfortable is the upper floor. So it's a, a kind of a fun way of going about making sure that uh, um, you're dealing with, uh, you know, the, the different areas of the house and making sure that they are comfortable. Now, in the, in the certification process, of course, I have to prove that there's not a, a room vulnerable to overheating or underheating. And so I'm in the process of making sure about that. And that helps, it helps that we're in the process as well of dialing in the, the flow rates for the, the HRVs. Um, separating the heat recovery ventilators also helps us fall in within the, the uh, separa separating, pardon me, the ventilation air also helps us fall within the, the Calgary city code is, you know, attached suites, um, even though that shares the hot water system. Now, I don't believe the meters are split, are they Axel? No, they're not. No. So, no. so that's the thing. So the electric service is common. So it does mean that both, and uh, the, you know, the appliance selections have been made and, and the clients are, are uh, going to be, uh, you know, both using uh, low, low energy appliances. Going forward, um, we, we are actually purchasing one sand and heat pump and a hot water tank, and that will be sufficient to allow the servicing of both units with domestic hot water. There's no code requirement for separating your hot water system because, of course, if a fire bursts a line, then you've got automatic, uh, you know, fire suppression because you have water spraying out. Um, so that's not as big an issue. And uh, the one thing, because this is a uh, one family, they're going to be able to monitor the energy bills and understand um, the energy usage somewhat. One thing that uh, the client was interested in and uh, submitted when we did the SSRIA uh, funding is to do a fair uh, amount of monitoring post-construction and partly for their purposes as well. They want to know how to split the electrical bill and partly just because it's interesting and partly to help prove um, the system. Um, going forward in terms of energies. So when they do, if let's say they do go to sell the house in five, 10 years or whenever, they're gonna have a record of not only monitoring but energy bills that they can rely on. So if the, if the property is purchased by two different families and they decide they want a different mix population in there, because right now it's a duplex with three people total and that's what it's planned for, then uh, and then they'll they'll be able to do that. There be, can be a fair division of the uh, 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 of the bills, and, and they'll understand that. As well, the uh, the pipes have been run for a second uh, sand and unit to be put outside, so a second hot water heat pump. And depending on um, who they sell it to, that could be a condition of sale that that's installed and commissioned and ready to go to provide that extra boof, boost of heat. And at that time. Um, also, the because the uh, uh, HRVs are um, available, um, alterations could be made to add a second post heater as well, because the heat pump system could definitely um, take that load on. Well, it makes perfect sense from a sustainability perspective mm -hmm. and uh, cost perspective to be sharing as much of that as possible. So, well, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess yeah. the thing to add is that there is no gas to the to the site. It's all electric house, and yeah, I guess. Similarly, that uh, it, it's very tough to get to Passive House Classic unless you have kind of ideal solar gains uh, in our climate. So them going towards a Passive House low energy building it is 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 more common what is done, especially when you don't have the full like a 50 foot frontage to the south. Mm -hmm. If you're in a more standard 
uh, urban skinny lot, uh, you can still get to passive house low energy and, and the, the mechanical system design is almost the same. Mm -hmm. So I guess Celia had one other question for you, Axel. Um, can you, are you sharing your final blower door test and would you build another passive house in the future or are you going to more stick with a net zero or the combination thereof or thoughts on those two things? I, I would, um, yeah, definitely share my blower door score. Currently pre-drywall, we got down to 0.45. So we'll see where, where I end up with drywall and the exterior wasn't quite finished at that point either. So we'll see where that ends up. We originally, and definitely um, from my experience, like I, I had been getting into the 0.4s with just regular bat and poly work no SIGA tape and I mean we put we blasted a ton of time into um making sure that membrane was tight and having uh um the 0.45 I was kind of hoping I was going to be into the 0.3s to be perfectly honest with you and maybe that's where I end up I'm, I'm not sure I've never done it where I've uh like using tape you know there's no compression left to to seal your air barrier it's done but in the past I've been using you know acoustic caulking and and compression to seal my houses so you have to have the drywall on so pre-drywall I never have a good reliable number but at this point I should have a good reliable number and at 0.45 I was kind of hoping to be at the 0.3 so we'll see where I end up but um, one of the things that I on the air barrier part um, one of the things that I really enjoyed taking this project on was I got to do something different from you know uh, a build that was uh, a little more simpler this one I've definitely learned a little bit more about doing the passive house way and, and, uh, um, and I've really enjoyed that because I, I don't want to be just only doing net zero homes. If, um, uh, if, uh, people come to me and want a passive home, I would like to be able to provide that. I would like to be the, a builder that knows how to do all sorts of high performance home, uh, and basically be able to build you whatever, uh, whatever high performance home you would like to do. Obviously I've got my preferred building methods that I would like to do for people, but, uh, um, yeah, anything, I, I definitely don't want to be someone that can't take on a certain build or whatever. So yes, mm -hmm. I, I would take on other passive homes. Yeah. Comment on the, uh, um, the, just a, a construction process comment. The first blower door test we did was just after the um, internal, the vapor barrier was installed around the interior of the house. But before any interior partition walls or, or uh, any of the wall blocking for the mechanical chase, the extra two by four wall in the interior was done. So if you do it that way, you have access to 100% of the vapor barrier, aside from what's under the slab and, and the, the part that's actually the rim joist um, on the exterior, but the majority of the vapor barrier is available to you. And uh, so at that point, you can chase the blower door test. My experience, if, if you do it that way in passive houses, that your blower door test, the difference between pre-drywall and post-drywall isn't all that significant. Uh, you don't have that significant jump in, in, uh, um, seal, in air sealing, um, air tightness once you put the drywall on. And a further, a shout out to Celia as well, because she was on site for, uh, I think, all the blower door tests to give us a hand with that project. At first, just more or less as a volunteer, just saying, hey, gives her a chance to uh, learn about it and, and uh, give a hand. And uh, we had uh, two. So as a result, um, Cooper from Four Elements Design um, gave us a hand. He did the blower door test. So he had a thermographic camera and a... Uh, and uh, the and the with, during the blower door test, and uh, I did as as well. So Celia manned the second blower door, uh, pardon me, thermographic camera, and that was invaluable not only for catching uh, uh, holes in the air barrier that we had to then deal with uh, that we could repair on the spot, but also there were a couple of gaps in the insulation that were caused by the. Um, the way that the cellulose was installed and that allowed us to catch those gaps and repair them. Um, so we had a combination of tape, spray foam, thermographic cameras and my favorite uh, method for testing uh, for air leakage as well which is the back of your hand. Um, uh, just one note, I find smoke candles which is a, a 
said to be a popular way of going about it to be relatively useless in a in a passive house because the leaks that you're chasing are sometimes too small for a smoke candle to actually give you very much of a result and if you have something that re that a smoke candle will react to most likely you've not done a good job up front so the thermographic camera and uh, just feeling for the air leaks was actually a, a more useful way of going about it it was great okay all right we're coming up on one o'clock so if you guys need to go and uh, get back to work or whatever thank you for coming uh we are going to be taking a uh, few months off so the next coffee talk will probably be in september uh so we have uh, some suggestions on who we want to hear from uh, feel free to send them in but uh, i'm happy to stay if kevin and axel if you guys are still free if there's any other questions there was one um from tom just wondering uh if you've looked at uh, using the si construction system of upgrade like uh, basically all the way from the foundation all the way up to the roof uh if you've looked at that one before are you able to stay, Axel, or are you being called away? I, I, I could, I'll stay for, I got to play another 10 minutes in me and then I, I got to go back to site here, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. So I maybe could, just, uh, yeah. If one of you want to chat to the SI construction, then Axel will let you go and uh, see if any of the other questions. Yeah, Axel, if you want to address that quick and I'll, I'll uh, in, a, in a sec here, I'll share the screen and we can look at the uh, wall assembly data. Sorry, can, it, can you just um, restate the question there for me, please? Just uh, using the SI construction system all the way up, like instead of just below grade, using it above grade as well. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, we did like with definitely with the high performance homes, like I said, everything's economic. So we chose not to do it above grade just because of um, the cost, but the cost was not that far off uh for the si i believe when i did my cost analysis with where lumber was i believe this was back in september um uh the si was about four thousand dollars more all said and done uh installed so uh um i think it'd be interesting to do it above grade for sure uh there yeah like the wall is 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 a very interesting system so I mean, the short answer would be, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would be interested to do it above grade one day. I did, I, I just had a house that we were um, doing a wall assembly analysis on. And unfortunately the house had uh, 10 feet of backfill and the steel prices have went up here quite drastically here um, in the last little bit. Um, but that, that foundation system didn't prove to be nearly as cost effective to go with uh, SI. So we, the guy was maybe gonna do SI all the way up to the, to the underside of the roof there. And that would have been interesting, but it didn't quite pan out there. Yeah, materials, uh, um, material prices are kind of going all over the price right now. So it's hard to get, uh, hard to get any hard pricing, but uh, there, there's definitely ways again, to keep your, keep your design simple. And uh, then it gives you more options on uh, what products yeah. to use. Yeah. yeah. Um, with that, uh, um, you know, I've I've been telling clients that approach me for new houses. Um, look, the the COVID premium on lumber is about seventy percent. It's adding about forty to sixty five thousand dollars, depending on the project, to the cost of the average new house build rate right at the moment. So I'm saying to clients, look, let's plan this year and build next year from the time of first contact. So if you're at the stage of say Dave Van Escher or others that are considering building a home from the time you first reach out and start thinking about it until you can actually get shovels in the ground, it's roughly a year, um, to, especially if it's a remotely custom home. You can um, chase that a little bit by, by picking up a, a set of plans, but you better darn well make sure that that's, those set of plans are passive house plans because you do not save any money buying, say, a two thousand dollar set of plans off the internet, and then trying to make it passive house. You just you're chasing your tail all over the block. There's just no point. Um, as well, when you start drawing plans, just as another comment, um, give yourself don't draw two by six walls. Endless headaches. You get welded into thinking about interior space a certain way given your setbacks. Yeah, good luck because you've got to draw 14 inch thick walls on the exterior. So all the way around the outside, 
draw 14 inch thick walls if you're dreaming about a floor plan and then and then work within that. Um, it's all it's like pulling teeth and it's really expensive to go from a two by six wall to a thicker wall system. Everybody thinks they're giving up walls uh, floor space. Um, so anyway, um, a further comment on the SI construction um, deal here. Let me just share the yeah, maybe Kevin, Kevin, maybe before you share, maybe we'll let Axel go. Um, sure. Because we don't want to steal too much of his time before something explodes or his kids or otherwise. So uh, thank you very much, Axel, for, uh, for your time today. And uh, yeah, we hope you conti continue uh, building excellent homes for excellent people. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for having me on, Frank. I appreciate it. And uh, anytime. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon, Axel. Okay. Take care, guys. Have a good one. Take it easy. Yeah. Bye. I am more than happy myself to hang out for a bit if anybody has some further questions. But I'll just to continue with Tom's question, I'll go ahead and, and share, share the uh, my screen. And this is the assemblies sheet. So it gives you an idea of the U values of various systems. Um, so the double stud wall, as far as I know, let me just double check and make sure I'm because I quite often use that that area to to uh, yeah, there we are, two user design to model uh, different alternatives right at the beginning. So this double stud, uh, wall double stud is the actual wall that we went with and that's the, uh, that's the, um, the figure on that. Um, Frank and I actually had an interesting discussion about how you would model the, the uh, exterior um, rain screen, which is right here. I usually don't credit it as being anything. It does save some um, solar gain for cooling. Um, can you uh, blow that up a bit, Kevin? Important. It's a little hard to see. So oh, pardon me. Yeah, thank you. View, let me go. Just, just zoom in on Excel. Yeah. How's that? That's yeah, better. Better, yeah. There we go. So yeah, I, I very rarely credit that for anything to do with uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, U value on a wall. I basically discredit it, but it does make a difference and, and requires some further research because it does, or not research, but some further analysis because it does uh, make a difference for heat gain um, during the summer season, which is good for cooling. Um, so that's at 108. If you look at, if there's the foundation below ground, I'm gonna skip back to the areas and just make sure again, I'm looking at the right things. So the below ground is the seven and eight. So that's, uh, this is if we're doing, doing things uh, different. So this is interesting as well though. This is a eight inch concrete foundation with eight inches of uh, um, GPS graphite blown polystyrene and that's what the review value ends up being. But what we did was use this as the below ground, the SI foundation system below ground. And it's 0 0.170. The SI foundation system above ground, including some three quarter inch EPS foam, some five eighths pressure treated ply, and that allowed the foam allows you to do a uh, EFIS style application of stucco parging on the outside using acrylic stucco. And that's 0.119, uh, yeah, 119. So if you're thinking about going right up to the underside of eaves, that's pretty much the best you can bargain on. You do have the option of providing more exterior, exterior foam, making that much thicker and adjusting that. Yeah, there's that option, but 0.119, as opposed to uh, there we are, 1.108 is, is significant. That's a significant difference in a U value um, in terms of the overall performance. So that's, that's one thing. And the other thing I'll say about the idea of going right to the roof with that kind of a foam and steel stud system. Now that, that uh, foam and steel stud, the EPS foam and steel stud is going to have a lower embodied energy number than concrete and exterior foam. If, and actually SIC um, um, 
systems, you can get their system with the same graphite blown EPS, which has a lower global warming potential and lower ozone depletion potential than, than straight EPS. So you can chase your numbers a little bit like that, but the combination is steel studs and, uh, and uh, uh, foam um, is far, has far more global warming potential, far higher embodied energy than, uh, than uh, a double stud wall with blown in cellulose. And blown in cellulose is one of the best insulations from that point of view. Uh, wood fiber uh, meets, comes fairly close. And after that, when you're looking at insulation systems, wool, recycled blue jeans, um, cork, there's a whole bunch of uh, types of insulation that uh, are low embodied energy as well, but they're also very expensive. Um, blown in cellulose, uh, rock, sold, rock wool insulation, even pink fiberglass, they're all made in Western Canada. The blown in cellulose is made just outside of Edmonton. And it's a low temperature, low energy process using recycled wood, wood fiber from paper and cardboard. And you can't get much better than that. Now, when you're working with a passive house, the passive house system doesn't directly force you to model for embodied energy. But hopefully that'll, that is, the awareness of that is, is increasing hugely because when you think about it, having a heat demand, if you meet Pasifos Classic of, of, of uh, 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, and the energy use of a Pasifos is so remarkably low. I mean, that, that number means that basically a glorified hairdryer, two glorified hairdryers could have heated this building, right? It's extremely low energy demand. So overall operational energy as a proportion of the entire cost of the build in terms of greenhouse gases is much lower than with the traditional just cold minimum house. And so that forces us to take a real solid look at what we're doing with the building itself, with the building envelope, the building construct. So below grade, I have a hard time um, coming up with a, an insulation system that's all that different in terms of uh, embodied energy than, than foam. And you need some kind of structure that there's embodied energy implications there. So I have a hard time getting beyond that. But above grade, you do have the option of using wood and cellulose. Um, fortunately, the COVID premiums kicking the crap out of the price of wood rate at the moment, but uh, that's not gonna last forever. And in terms of uh, embodied energy, you just, you can't beat that kind of system. So that's a, that's a real consideration as well. Yep. Yeah, I definitely agree that, yeah, double, double side blown cellulose is, is kind of the best of, of just about every world. It's low cost and low embodied carbon, but uh, yeah, there are different options. And yeah, you start with a passive house building and add on whatever, any other green goals that you, uh, that you have. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyone else still online have any other, I guess, final uh, questions before we kind of wrap it up for today? Um, definitely an interesting session. Lots of, lots of good things learned, lots of uh, good local, uh, local um, knowledge being passed around. So uh, yeah, thank you all for uh, coming then, if nothing else. Yeah, thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, have Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, appreciate it. yeah, quite welcome. We'll talk to y'all later then.